Welcome back everyone, this is Dr. Gallenstein. Today will be the second lecture in a series of lectures on the topic of equilibrium and efficiency. In the last lecture, I gave you kind of a brief conceptual overview of the issue of equilibrium and efficiency. I said that it, a market is in equilibrium when, it, when all the trading has ceased, when all economic activity has ceased. And an equilibrium is characterized by how resources are allocated at that point and the prices at which those uh, goods and services um, were sold. Okay, and then I said that an equilibrium um, is efficient in a free market. I, I said that efficiency is going to be characterized by what I call Pareto optimal or Pareto improvement. And this, this, this concept of efficiency comes from this idea that, um, that an efficient outcome is one in which no one could be made better off without making someone else worse off. Okay, so a market is efficient, or an equilibrium is efficient, when it is a Pareto optimal. That is, no one can be made better off without making someone else worse off. And then I made the argument that in a free market, filled with voluntary exchanges, entered into by rational agents, will be, will achieve an efficient equilibrium. It'll be efficient because every voluntary trade satis is a Pareto improvement because no rational agent would enter an exchange that makes them worse off. And so all free trades make at least one of the agents in the trade better off without making the other worse off. And if that's the case, then when the market e reaches equilibrium and all the voluntary trades have been made, the equilibrium will be Pareto optimal. It'll be efficient. I want to illustrate that concept graphically today. So let's begin. I want to assume, let's make a very simplifying assumption, all right? We're going to make some assumptions that are very simplifying so that we can illustrate. So we can illustrate the conceptual concepts we, that we talked about last time. So we're going to assume that we have an economy with two people. It's an economy with only two people. There's no production. That means there's no firms. Okay? And there's two goods. Each of the two people start with what I'm going to call an initial endowment. The two people are both going to start with an initial endowment. That means they're going to start with some amount of the two goods. So an initial endowment is some amount of the two goods. Okay, so let's say that the two goods are The two goods are, um, what are some good examples? I'll just go back to uh, an example from class, cereal and bagels, all right? I teach this class in the morning, and so I'm always thinking about breakfast. Okay, so the goods are going to be cereal and bagels. Okay, so the two people in this two-person economy they're both going to start off with some amount of coffee and bagels. All right, with these assumptions in place, let's go ahead and begin to illustrate these concepts graphically. So I'm gonna draw, I'm gonna start by drawing something that will look quite familiar. This is a graph that presents the trade-off between cereal and bagels. Okay, and if you can remember, so, so at this point, here at the origin, at this point, this would be the point where this agent has zero bowls of cereal and zero bagels. Okay, all right, and now you'll recognize this. This, is a little bit, this looks very familiar. We can draw some indifference curves here, which we'll label with I. Um, and the further away from the origin the indifference curve is, the more utility that the agent will derive from those combinations of cereal and bagels. Every point on the indifference curve is some combination of cereal and bagels. 
and every point on a given indifference curve is a combination of cereal and bagels that give the agent the same amount of utility. So if the agent consumed um, a bundle of cereal and bagels according to responding to point C, they would get the same utility as if they consumed a bundle corresponding to point B, uh, as they would get the same amount of utility if they consumed a bundle at point A. Okay, so this is all pretty clear, kind of review. We have indifference curves. The further away the indifference curve is from the origin, the more utility that the agent will derive. Okay, so I'll just put two on here for now. Okay, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to use this indifference curve, um, these indifference curves, I'm going to use uh, this graph to create a graphical representation of this two-person economy that I've described here. I'm going to do that this way. I'm going to say that this graph that I've drawn here is a, represent is a representation of person one's preferences. Okay. Now, I could very well, likewise, draw a very similar graph, cereal and bagels, for person two. So let's say I did that. I drew a very similar graph, the indifference curves, for person two. All right. In this two-person economy, both, peop both agents, both people, are going to have some preferences about um, cereal and bagels. All right, so we can describe both of their preferences. We can describe both of their preferences graphically using these graphs. Well, now what I want to do is I want to do something kind of creative. I want to take I want to take this graph and I want to put it into the same graph as person one's. I want to take person one's preferences and person two's preferences, and I want to illustrate them in the same graph. Oops. Okay, so this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to take person two's preferences and I'm going to rotate them. I'm going to rotate them 180 degrees and I am going to put them on the same graph with person one. So I'm rotating person two's preferences 180 degrees. All right, so now this, at this point, person two has zero bowls of cereal and zero bagels. All right, so this is person two's preferences. Okay, just to make this clear, actually let me add person two has some indifference curves. Just like person one has indifference curves. All right, so person two has indifference curves and person one has indifference curves. So just to be clear, person two drives more utility as we go this direction in this figure and person one derives more utility as we go this direction in this figure. So as we go, as we go this direction, person two is receiving larger bundles, larger bundles of cereal and bagels. As we go this direction, person one is receiving larger bundles of cereal and bagels. So person one receives more utility when we're out this direction, person two receives more utility when we're out in this direction. Okay, this illustration is something called an Edgeworth box. Okay, and this Edgeworth box is an illustration of the two-person economy. The Edgeworth box is an illustration of the two-person economy. 
Okay, we're going to call this, we actually would call this a pure exchange economy. Pure exchange economy. We call it pure exchange because this has no production. No one's producing anything. It's just an economy in which people are trading goods. Okay, so then this illustration, this Edgeworth box, illustrates a two-person economy. All right, so let's, let's make a couple of things clear. Imagine that I had this point. All right, if I had this point, this point implies that person one has, let's say, B1 of bagels. And person one has C1 of cereal. Likewise, person two, we'll call it B2 of bagels, and C2 of cereal. So let's just give some random, let's give some arbitrary numbers to this. We might say maybe, so. So if, if this is the origin point and it's zero, zero, this might, and let's say that the maximum point is, let's say it's 10, let's do the same thing for bagels, then it might be that C1 is about four. And so then likewise, starting from person two's origin, C2 might be six. And then let's do bagels, let's see, this might be eight, and then this might be two. So in this economy, in this economy, at this point, at this point, the allocation of goods would be like this. We'll call this, we'll call this, um, we'll call this W, okay? And W has is, is um, gives you bundles, so bundles of cereal and bagels. So person one's W would be four bowls of cereal and eight bagels, whereas person two would be six bowls of cereal and two bagels. So at this point, this point describes an allocation of goods in this economy. And we've described it like this. Person one has four bowls of cereal and eight bagels. Person two has six bowls of cereal and two bagels. Okay, and likewise, we could define other points on this graph, and every time we define a point, that this point is communicated to us some allocation of the goods in the economy. Okay, so that's just helping to illustrate, um, helping to helping to illustrate uh, how this graph works, how this Edgeworth box works. Every point in this box is a particular allocation of the, the two goods in the economy, the cereal and the bagels. Okay, now with that said, let's go another step further and let's talk about how this illustration allows us to think about the preferences um, of the agents in this two-person economy. So now let's imagine that this point here that I've drawn, and I'm going to label it W, we're going to call W the initial endowment. We're going to call W the initial endowment. By initial endowment, this is what we mean. The initial endowment is just the amount of the goods that the people in this economy start with. When they wake up in the morning, they have W. Person one has four bowls of cereal and eight bagels. Person two has six bowls of cereal and two bagels. This is just what they start with. And so when they wake up in the morning, and this is what they have, we can illustrate the utility that they would derive from the this particular combination of um, of goods. If this is what they have, then person one will be lying on this indifference curve, 
and person two will lie on this indifference curve. So when they start with the initial endowment W, they will be starting with, um, with a, a, a combination of goods that provide them with the utility that corresponds to whatever indifference curve would intersect with that bundle. So we're just going to illustrate that. For person one, it is this indifference curve here. And for person two, it's this indifference curve here. OK, so now, as I mentioned before, person two would prefer any bundle that's further away from the origin. That is, they would prefer any bundle that would lie on an indifference curve that is a higher indifference curve than this one. Likewise, person, oh, did I say, uh, hopefully I said person two. So person two prefers any bundle that lies in this direction. That is, they prefer any bundle that would lie on an indifference curve that is, um, that is further from their origin than this I2. Likewise, person one would prefer any bundle that goes in this direction. That is, they would prefer any bundle that would lie on an indifference curve that is further away from their origin than I1. Okay, so if person one would prefer any bundle in this direction, in, the, in, in this direction, and person two would prefer any bundle in this direction, we, begin, we can begin to talk about this notion of Pareto improvement or Pareto, uh, or Pareto optimal. So let's talk about that in light of this. Okay, so let's talk about that in light of this. All right, assume that we had a bundle here. Assume we had a bundle here. Let's call it bundle A. Bundle A is some combination of goods. I'm just going to eyeball it. Bundle A is, is something like this, where person one would have, it uh, looks like maybe nine and eight. Uh, I think I have that backwards. Eight bowls of cereal and nine um, bagels. And person two would have, it looks like maybe um, one and two. OK. So this would be bundle A. This would be bundle A. Now the question is, would bundle A be a Pareto improvement? So if the economy moved from W to A, if the economy moved from W to A, would that be a Pareto improvement? Well, let's see. At point A, person 1 is getting a bundle with larger quantities of both cereal and bagels, right? Cereal goes up from four to eight. Uh, bagels goes up from eight to nine. So they're getting a bigger bundle. This bundle is further away from the origin for person one. So person one would be made better off at bundle A. Okay, so that's half of it, right? A Pareto improvement is, is uh, a scenario that makes one person better off at least one person better off without making anyone else worse off. So at bundle A, person one will be made better off. But what would happen to person two? Look, for person two, they, person two drastically reduces the number of, um, drastically reduces the number of uh, cereal and bagels. I think I have this backwards. Drastically reduces the number of cereal and bagels from six to two and from two to one. Looking at it graphically, at bundle A would put person two on an indifference curve that would be closer to their origin. So it's very clear that bundle A would make person two worse off. And so the question is, is bundle A, would bundle A be a Pareto improvement? Would bundle A be a Pareto improvement? And the answer clearly is no. Bundle A would make person one better off, but would make person two worse off. So bundle A is not a Pareto improvement. OK, well, let's think about another bundle. What if we had a bundle out here? Let's call this bundle B. 
would bundle B be a Pareto improvement? If we moved from bundle W to bundle B, would that be a Pareto improvement? Well, again, and this might be more clear, I'll move more quickly, bundle B would be preferred for person two. Person two would love to have bundle B because they would be on a much higher indifference curve. But person one would be on a much lower indifference curve. And so bundle B would make person two better off, but it would make person one worse off. So bundle B is not a Pareto improvement because although it makes one person better off, it would make another person worse off. So bundle B is not a Pareto improvement. Okay, so hopefully that illustrates kind of what this might look like. What, it, what does it mean, like a Pareto improvement uh, in this economy? So then the next question that I have is this. Is there a way, is there a way for agents in this economy? They wake up in the morning, they have, they have this as their bundle. Is there any way for agents in this economy to make any exchanges that would be Pareto improving? Well, if we look carefully at this graph, what we'll see is that in this region, between the two indifference curves, in this region, between the two indifference curves, we have bundles that would make both person one and person two better off. So any bundle in this region would make both person one and person two better off. That means any bundle any bundle in here, 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 any bundle in that space would make both agents better off. Okay, let me let me quickly recap a couple one thing to uh, maybe drive this point home. I put I put two bundles out here. I put a bundle A and I put bundle B. We said the bundle A is not Pareto improving. We said the bundle B is not Pareto improving. Well, let me ask this question. If bundle A is not Pareto improving, would the two agents enter a voluntary exchange that would allow them to move from W to A? No. Rational agents would not enter an exchange unless they were coerced. Rational agents would not enter an exchange that would make um, one of them worse off. Basically this, person two would not voluntarily enter an exchange that would move them from W to A because moving them from W to A to, would make them worse off. And they are utility maximizers. They only will make decision. They will not make a decision that will make them lose utility. So person two would not enter a voluntary exchange. So there's no way that the economy is long, if there are voluntary exchanges, as long as this is a free economy, the economy will never end up at point A if they started at point W. Because no rational because if person two is rational, they would not agree to any exchange that would move them from W to A. Likewise, point B is not a point that the economy can reach because person one would never agree to enter exchanges that would cause them to move from bundle W to bundle B because at bundle B they achieve less utility. They achieve less utility at bundle B. Okay, so bundle A and bundle B are both bundles that the economy will not achieve. We will not end up here through free voluntary exchanges because, because person one would never be willing to trade to any allocation of the goods that would make them worse off. And person two would never make voluntary trades to arrive at a bundle that would make them worse off. So all of, all of the space in this Edgeworth box that is below I1 or let's see, closer to the origin, closer to person one's origin from I1, 
and closer to person 2's origin from I2, all of that space in the Edgeworth box are bundles that cannot be achieved through voluntary exchange because they make agents worse off. In light of that, in light of that discussion, all of the bundles in this space, all of the bundles in this space, these are all bundles that person one and person two would be willing to trade to because they would make at least one of them better off. Okay, so that means every bundle, every bundle in this space, every bundle in this space, let's say, every bundle in this space, we could say this for example, every bundle in this space is a, would be a Pareto improvement to move from it would be a Pareto improvement to move from W to any bundle in this space because any bundle in this space gives both agents or at least one agent more utility, making them better off, without making the other agent worse off. Okay, so all the bundles in this space are bundles that could be achieved through voluntary exchanges between rational agents. Okay, in light of that, in light of that, we now have a basis for visualizing basically how an economy might achieve a, um, how an economy might achieve an equilibrium that would be efficient. All right, so let's take it to the next step. Let's assume, again, that we have this economy, okay? And in this economy, in this economy, the two agents, agent, uh, the, two, the, two, the, the two people, the two agents, start off with this initial endowment of W. So they wake up in the morning and they have initial endowment W. Okay, now let me first do this. Assume that they wake up in the morning, they wake up in the morning, they have this initial endowment, but then I coerce their decisions and I say, I say, you are not allowed to trade. So I'm, I'm constraining them. They're not able to make voluntary exchanges. I'm saying they are not allowed to trade at all. If they're not allowed to trade at all, then, then just by imposition, W is an equilibrium. All right, so basically, let's say we have scenario one. Scenario one, no trades allowed. All right, so in scenario one, there's no trades allowed, in which case W is the equilibrium. Now my question for you is, is W efficient? Is W efficient? Now what's efficiency? Efficiency is a Pareto optimal. Pareto optimal is this. No one can be made better off without making someone else worse off. Now looking at the, looking at the equilibrium W, is it possible that someone can be made better off without making the other person worse off? Well, yes, we've already said that. At any bundle within this space, at least one of the agents would be made better off. But because we are imposing no trades, the economy can't move from W to any of the points in this space. Which means that at equilibrium W, it is possible that someone can be made better off without making the other worse off, which means it is not efficient. So we've just illustrated here that if we constrain free decisions, if we constrain the, the, the trades that agents are able to make, we will result, we will achieve a inefficient, not efficient, an inefficient equilibrium. W is an inefficient equilibrium. 
the, the goods in this economy are not allocated as, as well as they could be. Because we could, if we could allocate them differently, let's say we could allocate them to this point. If we could allocate them to that point, it would make both agents better off. But because we've constrained the voluntary decisions that the agents can make, we end up with an equilibrium that is not efficient. Okay. All right. So now let's do, let's do scenario two. So W, in scenario one, W, inefficient equilibrium. All right. Now, let's stay with the orange. Scenario two, free trade. All right, now, person one and person two wake up in the morning. Person one observes that this is what they have. Person two wakes up that this is what they have. And they're able to enter free exchanges. They're able to choose, um, they're able to trade with each other. Now just looking at their initial endowments, we might think that, well, person two has more, um, has, has more of, uh, more cereal than person one has. Person one has more bagels than person two has. So looking at the situation, acknowledging what we know about marginal utility, we might assume that to some extent, person two would probably put higher value on one, uh, oops, sorry, on one additional bagel than person one. That means person two would probably put more value on their third bagel than person one would put on their eighth bagel. And likewise, person two might put less value on their sixth bowl of cereal than person one puts on their fifth bowl of cereal. And so with that in mind, there might be justification for a trade. Maybe maybe they could enter a trade like this, where person one will give person two a bagel in exchange for a bowl of cereal, in which case they would end up with an, equal, with an allocation like this. It'd be five and seven for person one, and person two would be five and three. This would have been a trade. They've traded one for one. They've traded one for one. Now, after they've traded, if they have agreed to that trade, then that means it is making at least one of the two agents, probably both of them, better off. All right, so this would be an example of a trade. They've moved from equilibrium W to equilibrium, um, from the basically the green W, now to equilibrium orange W. So let's put that on the graph. Let's say that it's somewhere about here. Okay. All right, in that case, maybe I'll slightly change my colors here. All right, they will be on different indifference curves. We got a little. Okay. All right, so now we're at a point of intersection, right? So now we have a different bundle, bundle W, bundle orange W. I'm sorry, let's, let, me, let me change this. All right, I'm just gonna put this bundle here. There we go, okay. So now they've made a trade and having made that trade, they achieve different indifference curves that are further from their origin that they both agree is an improvement. All right, so now they're at a different bundle. Let's say it's bundle, let's say it's bundle W. 
Okay. Now, now that they've traded, they've traded from the green W to the orange W. All right, so now they're no longer on the old indifference curves, they're on these new indifference curves. Now, when they're at bundle W, orange W, I'll ask you the same question I asked before, is W efficient? All right, well, when we look at that, we can see that there are no longer any bundles that would simultaneously make person one better off while not making person two worse off. Likewise, there are no bundles that would make person two better off without making person one worse off. That means that this new bundle is a Pareto optimal. So yes, it is efficient. So now what we've seen is that through free voluntary trades, the agents can move from an inefficient equilibrium green W to an efficient equilibrium orange W. So that will illustrate to you, and hopefully we can see now that now when we when we look at these indifference curves, the two difference curves are tangent to each other. When we look at that, we can see when we look at this, we can see that the orange W, the new equilibrium that they reach, because the two indifference curves are tangent to each other, is a Pareto optimal. It's an efficient outcome. There's no other possible bundle that would that would improve one person's utility without improving the others, or without worsening the others. Okay. So that illustrates that illustrates um, how the free economy through free exchanges can achieve an efficient equilibrium, a Pareto optimal equilibrium. Okay, now with that in mind, let's piece it together just a couple more things before we close this lecture. I want to make a couple more observations. I want to make a couple more observations about this equilibrium W. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna erase this. All right, I wanna make a couple observations about this efficient equilibrium W. So at this point W, we're saying that this is efficient, this is a Pareto optimal. At this point, we can see something. We can see that person one's indifference curve is tangent to person two's indifference curve. Oh boy. Person one's indifference curve is tangent to person two's indifference curve. Let's actually, let's just get rid of these old ones. There we go. Okay, now remember the slope of an indifference curve? The slope of an indifference curve, let's do, let's, let's do this first. The slope of an indifference curve is the derivative of the good on the y-axis with respect to the good on the x-axis, okay? We call this the marginal rate of substitution and and the marginal rate of substitution we said is equal to the marginal utility of one of of of, of this good with respect to uh, or or I'm sorry divided by the marginal utility of the other good so the slope of person 1's indifference curve is the ratio of their marginal utility of bagels to marginal utility of cereal. So this would be person one's marginal rate of substitution. This is the slope of their indifference curve. Person two's is going to be the same. Marginal rate of substitution. Let's, let's get rid of this. Okay, person two's marginal rate of substitution is gonna be the same. Marginal utility of bagels divided by marginal utility of cereal. Now, 
at point W, we should recognize something. So at W, these two, these two marginal rates of substitution are equal to each other. And what does this imply? This implies that in this economy, that agents will trade, and they'll trade, and they'll trade, and they'll trade, until they reach a point at which the marginal rate of substitution between the goods equals each other. So person one's marginal rate of substitution will equal person two's marginal rate of substitution. It'll basically be like this. They will trade until the ratio of the marginal utility from each of the goods equals the um, ratio of the other person's marginal utility. All right, to make this a little bit more tangible, let's think about an example. Okay, so I want to make this illustration more tangible. So to do that, um, let me come over, let me come over here. Okay, and let's imagine that we have two people, um, one initial endowment, nine bowls of cereal and one bagel, person two, one bowl of cereal, nine bagels. In this case, person, and let, let's, let's apply that to here, all right, person one, all right, remember this is person one. This is person two. All right, person one will have a very low marginal utility of cereal. They'll have low marginal utility of cereal. So that's this low marginal utility of cereal, because they have so many bowls of cereal to begin with. We know that there's diminishing marginal utility. That means if I start out with nine bowls of cereal, that ninth bowl of cereal is not worth very much to me. Alternatively, for person one, they start off with only one bagel. We know from diminishing marginal utility that because they only have one bagel, the marginal value of that bagel is relatively high. Okay, so so person one starts off with a with a large marginal utility of bagels and a um, small marginal utility of, of of cereal, and the opposite is true for person two. Person two has only one bowl of cereal. I mean, the marginal value of that one bowl of cereal is going to be relatively large. And, and they start off with nine bagels. So the marginal value, the value of that ninth bagel is just not very high. They already have so many. So the marginal utility of bagels is relatively small. So now you can see that at this starting point, the marginal rate of substitution for person one is much higher it's going to be much, much higher than, than the marginal rate of substitution for person two. That means that person one is going to be willing to trade a lot of bagels to get, to get uh, more bowls of cereal. Likewise, person two is going to be willing to trade a lot of, um, a lot of bagels to get additional bowls of cereal. So we are well poised for trades. We're well poised for trades because person one would love to give away bagels in exchange for cereal, and person two would love to give away, I'm uh, sorry, I have that opposite. Person one would love to give away bowls of cereal to get bagels, and person two would love to give away bagels to get more cereal. Okay, and so their marginal rates of substitution don't equal each other. So let's do some trading. All right, I'll illustrate that trade in green. So now they're gonna trade. Let's say that they start off by trading one for one. And so they go on, and now it's two, uh, sorry. It's eight and two, and person two, it's two and eight. Okay, so they've gone and they've made a trade. Now what happens? Well, still, even after making this trade, person one still has uh, a relatively large marginal utility of bagels and 
So I have that backwards. No, no, I got it right. All right. Person one still has a relatively large marginal utility of bagels and a relatively small marginal utility of cereal. Person two still has a relatively large marginal utility of cereal and relatively small marginal utility of bagels. So the trading will continue. And let's say that it trades till this point. And I'll use a different color. Let's use brown. Person one. So it trades to the point where it's 50-50. At this point, person one's marginal utility for bagels is going to be somewhat similar. So it's going to, you know, it's going to be, I guess, somewhat moderate, and this will be somewhat moderate, and this will be somewhat moderate, somewhat moderate. And at this point, at this point, at this final point, now, now that they're equal, and it doesn't always mean that it doesn't always have to be that they're equal, it depends on their preferences, but in this illustration, they're equal. The, in terms of they both have the same amount of bagels and coffee. At this point, now the marginal rate of substitution, the ratio of the marginal rate of substitutions are equal to each other. And so the trading stops. So I hope this illustration demonstrates how these trades are based, so trades in the economy are based on the preferences of the agents in the economy. They'll make trades based on their preferences They'll only make trades that make themselves better off. So they'll only enter into voluntary exchanges that make them better off, or at least doesn't make them worse off. And the culmination of these trades will reach a point where um, there are no longer any voluntary trades that can be made without making someone else better off, uh, without making someone else worse off, without making someone worse off. So there's no more voluntary trades that can be made. And at this point, the marginal rates of substitution will equal each other between the two agents, and we will reach a Pareto optimal equilibrium W. Okay. I think we will conclude this lecture at this point. So this has been a visual illustration of um, equilibrium and efficiency and how the free market with voluntary exchanges allows the economy to reach a point of efficiency. In the next lecture, I will make this um, illustration uh, mathematical, and we will actually solve, um, actually, in the next lecture, we will, f okay, in the next lecture, we will consider prices and the economic implications of this, and the following lecture, we will put this in terms of mathematics and, um, and solve some practice problems. Okay, great, thanks. I uh, hope you have a good day and I'll see you next time.